Um, good morning, River Church. Uh, I'm excited, as always, to be here with you guys. And one of the things that, as we were singing, as we were doing our worship, uh, one of the lyrics to the song was, wave after wave in the ocean, or from the ocean. And man, it, it, that's, just, that's just what it's like to encounter God. It's just this wave after wave of love, of knowledge. He is an infinite uh, being. He is just, we will never, we could spend all our days trying to learn all there is to know about God, and, it, and we will never fully accomplish that. And so, like wave after wave, I pray that we just continue through our lives uh, to <clears throat> just pursue the Lord and learn about Him and just love Him more. And I pray that we do that uh, this morning. Um, I, uh, I love pr- productivity. I love to get organized. Uh, I love having, you know, uh, the planners and the calendars and the journals with the, the boxes you check and all of those things. I, I really like uh, productivity, you know, the, 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 um, I'll get the stopwatches to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm staying, staying on, on track. I'll get the whiteboards, the calendars. I'll do all those things uh, to, to become more uh, productive. But, but, but as, I'm, as, I'm, as, as, as I start to get into the mindset of becoming more productive, there's always a decision that needs to be made. Right? Should, I, should I go digital, and do everything on my phone, on a computer? Or should I go uh, old school, analog, write everything down, buy calendars, put stuff up on my wall? How should I go about productivity? <clears throat> right, should, should, I, should I have my task list on my, on my desk that I can look at as I'm working? Or should I have my task list on my phone? Now you can see already, I mean, the, service, the sermon's not about productivity, but you can see already how being productive can be very difficult. So one year, when I was uh, on this kick to become more productive, I, I made the decision, I said, you know what, I'm going to do this electronically. So I, I, I decided I was going to do it all on my phone. I downloaded the calendar apps, the, the um the reminders, uh, the, 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 the checklist, the task list. I, I did all of those things on my phone. I had my countdown timer. All of that stuff was on my phone. I was ready to go. I even organized my, my home screen to where it would limit my distractions so I could be as productive as possible. And it was great. It was a fantastic setup. But uh, I was still having problems. I was getting distracted. I was having trouble. You may, you may have experienced this. Sometimes when you want to do something on your phone, you, you have a thought you need to get something done, or, or maybe you need to, to check some list, or you need to do some task on your phone, and, and then you open up your phone, and, and as, as, you, as it's recognizing your face, you see all of your notifications. And then you're like, oh, my mom texted me. Oh, my wife needs milk at the house. Oh, uh... I got an email from, from such and such. And, and almost immediately, you forget wh- why you even got your phone to begin with. You get distracted. And this happened time and time again. And if, if I was able to get through this first line of distractions, right, this, this first attack... Right? Then, then, I, then I had to, to, to fight the temptation to get on social media or to, to fight this t- temptation to randomly check my emails or, or to play that, that game that is on my phone. And if it wasn't that, as I was going through the process, maybe I would get a text message or, or uh, from a group chat at work or, or I would get some sort of message about my kids' little league sports teams. It's constantly bombarded with distractions, and I was constantly being pulled away from what I was actually supposed to be doing. Now, the same is true for us as Christians. Right? The Lord calls us to pursue Him. The Lord calls us to live a certain way But oftentimes, there's so many things that distract us. 
There are so many things that pull us, that fight for our attention, for our allegiance, to pull us away from Jesus. And what we're going to look at today is <clears throat> our lives, right? Our lives. And so, so, so a lot of these things that are pulling us away are things that are, are in our own um, in our own lives, right? The things that are in our own lives, and I'll, we'll explain this as we go, but those things are the things that are pulling us away from following Jesus. And, and what I want us to see today is our lives, past, present, and future, are filled with things that will distract us, that want to pull us away from Jesus and to beg for our allegiance. As we go through today, I want us to see that even though these things are pulling us from Jesus, I want us to see that following Jesus is better. <clears throat> We're going to be in the book of Hebrews this morning. It's at the end of your Bible, so if you have your Bibles, it's at the end of that. And, and we're going to um, look at a story in Hebrews uh, over about the life of Moses. Now, just a quick recap. We, 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 we just finished our, mother, our, our, our womanhood, not motherhood, our womanhood series. And so I, I want to give us some context into Hebrews. Uh, essentially, in a nutshell, uh, Hebrews w w was written to a Jewish population who had professed faith in Christ, uh, but, the, but these, 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 these uh, people who were, were Jew Jews who began to profess faith in Christ were starting to be persecuted by the other Jews who did not believe in Jesus. And so the, 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 the temptation for the, the, these Jewish Christians was that if I, if I just go back to the way things were, if I just go back to uh, living under the Old Testament law, then I can alleviate some of this punishment. I can alleviate some of this um, persecution. And my life will be much easier. Our passage today is, is found in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, so Hebrews chapter 11 is the, it's, it's known as, although this, it doesn't say this in, in, in the book, but it's known as the Hall of Faith, right? So it's like the Hall of Fame, like Michael Jordan's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, but it's the Hall of Fame for people in the Old Testament who had uh, shown a great amount of faith. <clears throat> it recounts many people from the Old Testament who did uh, what was right, who ex exhibited faith um, in light of what uh, was to come in the future. So, I want to read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 um, and 2 to start off before we get into our Moses passage, uh, passage. It says, Now faith is the assurance, this is Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And so that's the, that's the beginning part of this, of this section that we're going to read. And it's basically saying that all of these people in the Old Testament uh, showed this great amount of faith in this future that was to come. And, and like I said, the story that we're going to look at today is, is the section that talks about Moses. Moses, like many figures uh, in this passage, Moses was not perfect. I don't want us to leave here and say, man, I need to make my life look like Moses, his life was not perfect. He had many failures in his life. Um, some of them that were ongoing character uh, defects. How, however, in Moses' life, there, there came a turning point. There came a time when he had to choose to either trust God and maybe trust in something that he couldn't fully grasp, 
and fully see or to go back to what he was comfortable with, to go back to what he was familiar with. And that is true for all of us in this room. We'll be in Hebrews 11, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. It says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Verse 24, By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Man, so this passage, right, it's, it's like all of Moses, right? We're going to look at all of Moses' life. We're going to look at specific things. We're not going to sit here and like read all five books of uh, the first five books of the Old Testament to learn about Moses. Uh, but there are specific things that, that this passage highlights that I want us to see uh, that, are, that are, are a lot of uh, ways that we ourselves can relate to Moses. And, and the, our first point is that Jesus is better than your past. Hebrews 11.24 says, By faith, when he was grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Right? Moses' past doesn't define his life. Many of us are hesitant to follow Jesus because of our past. Moses could have held on to his past but he didn't. And, and if he did, I don't think anybody would have blamed him. But he didn't. That's not what happened. Let's look at that verse again. It says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So this is a big deal. If you guys don't remember the story of Moses, uh, Moses and, and the, all of the Israelites were living in Egypt. And... <clears throat> um, and so the, 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 the Israelite population began to grow and grow and grow. And Pharaoh, uh, there was no longer a good relationship between the Israelites and the Hebrews that we had at the end of Genesis chapter 50 uh, with, um, with Joseph and that whole story, right? It says that Joseph had died and, and, and that there was a new Pharaoh in town and he forgot about Joseph's life, right? And so... So that's the, the, the setting that Moses was born into. And, and, and the, the Israelites are beginning to populate and grow. And, and Pharaoh's looking at these people like, oh man, these, if these people were to act out against us, if they were to fight us, they would completely defeat us. So here's what we're going to do. And he ordered all of the first, uh, all of um, the pregnant women if, or, or the midwives uh, if, if they were delivering a baby and it was a Hebrew boy, they were instructed to kill that baby. They were instructed to throw that baby into the river, to the Nile. So this is the life that Moses was born into. And his parents, they put him in a little basket. They threw him in the water. They're like, man, I don't want to do this. I don't want to just throw him and let him die. I want to try and preserve his life as long as possible. They put him in this basket, put him in the stream. He flows down the stream. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter finds the basket, sees Moses inside, and essentially uh, raises Moses as her son. This is crazy. This is crazy because Moses is now like the grandson of Pharaoh. 
right? He's growing up in, not as a, not as a Hebrew, but, but as an Egyptian. He's growing up under uh, the, and not just as an Egyptian, but as the, the, the royal family in Egypt. It's a big deal. Right? Moses knew the Egyptian customs. He knew the Egyptian way of life. He knew all that Egypt had to offer. This is Moses' story. But the crazy thing, cool thing about this is Moses chose not to identify with this, right? This, this Egyptian culture, this Egyptian lifestyle, this Egyptian royalty, Moses decided not to identify with that. The main idea here is that, that we use things in our past, good or bad, to justify why we shouldn't follow Jesus. <clears throat> Right? Some of us think that, you know, I had a pretty good life. I don't really necessarily need God. My, my life is good. Um, I ha- my family always had food on the table. Uh, there, there's no, uh, been no issues uh, with my family. We've always had money. We've always had great, uh, gone on nice vacations. No one in my house really loved or worshipped God, and things seemed to turn out okay. Right? We, we've, we, things have been pretty good, relatively speaking, without God. So, you know, I really have no use for him. Right? They're, they're, your past, and in this case, it's a, it's a relatively easy past, but your past um, is, is, is holding you back. Well, I, I've never really needed God, so I don't need him now. And then the flip side to that is maybe you've had a horrible past. I've heard of friends who, uh, <clears throat> you know, as I get to talk to them about Jesus and, and talk to them about going to church and, and being a Christian and all that stuff, uh, one of the comments out of their mouth is uh, that they'll often reply with is, man, Billy, if you just knew the things that I've done, you would, <laughs> I, the Lord would never want to accept a person like me. The Lord would never want to use a person like me. God doesn't need me. I'm broken. I'm fragile. I'm, I'm, I'm useless. God doesn't need me. So what in your past are you using to justify why you shouldn't follow Jesus? Regardless of your history, your story, Jesus is better. Jesus is better than your past. <clears throat> Jesus is also better than your present. Hebrews 11.25 says, uh, Choosing rather, this is Moses, uh, Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Moses saw what the Egyptian life had to offer, and he saw that it was lacking. He saw that the pleasures that people indulged in were fleeting. It says that Moses chose to identify as one of God's people than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. It's, it's interesting because he lived, like I said, we, we just discussed, his whole young life, his, his, his early life was spent in this Egyptian culture. And he had witnessed it and he had seen it firsthand. And he was familiar with it and he saw that it was lacking. Are we, uh, I, as I was preparing this message, I feel like we as Americans can relate to this idea so well, right? We have all of the pleasures 
right at our fingertips. One of the things about Egypt was Egypt was, was not only uh, did, did Moses grow up in Egypt in royalty, but Egypt was like the powerhouse uh, during this time period, right? People wanted to go to Egypt. P uh, Egypt was the place people wanted to be. And I feel like we can relate to this in our culture. We can indulge in any desire or anything that we wish to do, we can indulge in, we can do, and we can do it pretty instantly. We can have what we want when we want it. Now, you may have experienced this firsthand where, where you can just do whatever it is that you want to do and do it quickly, or you can have observed some of your friends who have made some decisions about, about engaging in the things that they want immediately, and you could see that it doesn't, it, it is not fulfilling. It is fleeting. The pleasures around us, the pleasures of sin, don't last. <clears throat> I mean, you could just see this. I mean, you can see this all over our culture, but if you just watch our celebrity culture, um, Man, it, it's, there's constant stories of infidelity. Uh, there's constant, continuous stories of drug addiction. There is excessive materialism. I bring them up, not to necessarily throw stones at them, but because they're, they're easy for us to all understand. In fact, me and Elise were talking about, my wife Elise, we were just talking about a celebrity yesterday um, and Lisa's like, man, that celebrity has just kind of gone off the deep end. <laughs> you remember that, Lisa? Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, it, it, but, but it's a person whose life was wrapped around, consumed with what this world had to offer. We are tempted with those ways as well. What are you uh, tempted to indulge in? What sin are you uh, tempted to pursue? What is enticing your eye? <clears throat> I mean, you could just pick whatever sin you want. I'm going to talk about adultery but but maybe someone at work has caught your eye maybe you've begun to confide in a person that you know you should not be confide confiding in i am dumbfounded it it it's it's shocking the amount of stories that i hear about infidelity it seems like it seems like it's a common practice Now, again, <clears throat> as, as we are tempted in these ways, and it may not be adultery, it may be something else, but whatever way that you are uh, uh, tempted to, to be drawn in, like in the case of adultery, that, that pleasure that you're looking for, that, that satisfaction that you're looking for is fleeting. It's not lasting. And it destroys families, and it destroys relationships it is not worth it. Pursuing, pursuing life outside of God's design is not worth it. The great news is Jesus is better than these fleeting pleasures. Man, Jesus gives us life. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us reconciliation he brings us into his family galatians 5 22 and 23 says but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such things there is no law these things under christ as christ gives us these things and as we are drawn in 
to them, <clears throat> these things are not fleeting. These are not going to, to fade. What Jesus gives us can actually endure. He gives us, we've, I preached about this a few months ago, He gives us a love that can endure. He gives us a joy that can endure. He gives us a peace that can endure. All the stuff that, that, that we are pursuing outside of Christ, uh, that we think we'll get love, we think we'll get joy, we think we'll have peace, but it is fleeting. The pleasures that attempt to draw us away from the Lord are fleeting. What we have been given from the Lord as we pursue Him, as we love Him, as we grow in His image, those things are able to endure. So we've seen in the story of Moses, we've seen that, that as Moses may have been tempted to be pulled away by his past, he chose the Lord as, as we see that Moses may have been tempted to engage in what was around him in the present, in today. We see that he, he chose the Lord instead. And what I, the third point I want us to see is Jesus is better than your future. Right? Moses saw the promise that Egypt had to offer and he saw that Jesus was better. Hebrews eleven twenty six and 27 says, He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward. He was not looking at, at what the future on this earth holds. He was looking to his future in eternity and what that held. That was his reward. By faith he left Egypt, Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. <clears throat> he could see the security that Egypt had to offer. Again, Egypt was the powerhouse, and Moses was connected. The future security was in Egypt. But Moses chose otherwise. What's holding on to you uh, in your future? What future hope do you have that is preventing you from completely pursuing Christ? <clears throat> and this is a tricky one, but what goals and hopes do we have for our future that are pulling us away from Jesus? A good way to answer this is what, what things are you doing in your life? Say you want to, say you want to have a successful business. Right, And you say, okay, well, if I want to have a successful business 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, I need to work 24-7, round the clock, all day, every day. If I do that, then my future will be pretty good. As we do that, though, as we pursue that, we're being pulled away from Sunday morning gatherings. We're being pulled away from our community of Christians walking with one another, worshiping Jesus together. There's nothing wrong with having professional goals at all. I'm not saying that. But are your professional goals pulling you away from fellowship with Jesus and His body? Pulling you away from fellowship with Jesus and His church. Read the passage again. It says, He considered the reproach of Christ, the cost of being a Christian, the ridicule that He would receive because of it, greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Being a Christian sometimes means that we are going to not get a certain thing that we may want or, or not get that promotion. I remember Randy years ago, um, <clears throat> he was talking about business dealings and he said, sometimes as a Christian in my business dealings, and I'm sorry if I misquote you, but sometimes in my business dealings, I'm going to get 
the shorter end, end of the stick. And that's okay. <clears throat> what is pulling us from our future? What are we hoping on to, uh, hoping in, uh, holding on to that is pulling us away from Jesus today? Then our last point is following Jesus. So we've talked about how, how following Jesus is, uh, is better than your past, your present, and your future. But I also want to talk about and show how following Jesus is better for others. Better for those around us. Hebrews eleven twenty eight says, By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the, of the firstborn might not touch them. As you walk in a way that Christ has called you to, and it's all throughout Scripture, we'll talk about that in just a second, it's not just beneficial for you, but it is beneficial for those around you. The passage that we're talking about here is, is dealing with the ten plagues. You might remember the story, uh, but it was um, <clears throat> the ten plagues of Egypt, and Moses was told that um, the firstborn of every house was going to be killed unless there was blood painted on the door frame of the house, right? And then the, the destroyer would pass over that house and not kill the firstborn in that house. And so as Moses was doing that and instructing others to do that, he saved many people from heartache. It was beneficial for many Following Jesus is better for others. This idea is clear throughout the scriptures, but, but I'm going to give you one example, and that's loving my wife, right? So as I love my wife, as I choose to commit my, uh, to my wife and care for her and be there for her and be the husband that Christ has called me to be and, and be the husband that scripture has called me to be, um, that, that, that's not just good for me, but it's good for my wife it's good for my kids. My kids are growing up in a stable household. As we follow Christ, as we follow what He calls us to, it's not just beneficial for us, but for those around us. I want to invite anyone who hasn't put their faith in Christ to respond to his call in your life today. Non-Christian, regardless of your past circumstances, regardless of what kind of history you have, we all got history, regardless of what kind of history you have, I invite you to come to Jesus, to respond to his call. Regardless of your history, regardless of your present pursuits, regardless of the things that you are currently pursuing, Jesus is better. Regardless of your future hopes, outside of Christ, those won't amount to much. Jesus is better. I invite you non-Christian to come respond to his call in your life today. If you are a Christian, <clears throat> maybe you came to Christ years ago, but you maybe haven't been as engaging as you should be. Maybe you aren't following Jesus the way you know you ought to. The evidence uh, what, what, the evidence for your life, right, if, if they were to ask you, are you a Christian? And you said, oh, yeah, I, 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 I professed faith 20 years ago, but, but, and, and that's your hope, but, but you haven't lived a life accordingly, right? You haven't, you, your hope is in a prayer that you said 20 years ago. <clears throat> I would encourage you to, to ask the question, what evidence is there in your life uh, of the gospel and, and Christ's work in your life today. 
Do you love worshiping Jesus and being with His people? You don't need the gospel only 20 years ago. We need the gospel today. I need to turn from sin. You need to turn from sin. We need to turn from sin today. Now, I'm not saying that there's this continual saving. I believe that once you are saved, you are saved. Right? You're, once you're just, that's a one-time deal. But there should be evidences in our life, and we need Jesus every single day to grow in his image. We need to run from sin today. Now, I know we don't do this perfectly, Christian, but I just would encourage you, if any of that stuff resonated with you, just, man, pursue him. Pursue his word. Pursue uh, uh, um, worshiping him. Pursue coming alongside him with other believers. Engage in his body. Engage in his church. I encourage you, encourage all of us, pursue Jesus today. Your best life is in following Jesus. <clears throat> now oftentimes is when we have a sermon like this or a thought like this, and these are my closing remarks, but oftentimes when we have a, a, a discussion like this, a sermon like this, we can get overwhelmed and we don't necessarily know what to do, right? We so desperately want to have some sort of assurance in our life Right? How do I know that what I'm doing is the right thing or the wrong thing? Right? I understand that Billy wants me to pursue Jesus. I, under, I understand that uh, Billy wants me to surrender and submit my life to Jesus. But what does that look like? And it can get very, very overwhelming. And, and, and I struggle with this too. How do I know if this decision is the best decision? I don't know if it's not the best decision. How do I know what to do? And many of you struggle with that question. And, and what I would encourage you with is what Psalm 119, 105 says. It says, your word, the scriptures, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Scriptures, the Bible, Jesus' word gives us what we need to follow Jesus and, and to walk with him and to, and, and to make the right decisions, he gives us all that we need for today in his word. He gives us wisdom. Um, he gives us encouragement. He gives us what we need for today. Yes, have those long-term plans. Yes, have all that stuff. But as far as today, we have all that we need in Scripture. I started wearing these what would Jesus do bracelets again for this reason. <clears throat> these bracelets don't save me, but it's a constant reminder to think what would Jesus do in this situation. Now, you don't just put this and then put this bracelet on, do whatever you want to do, but you, but you have an understanding of what the Bible teaches about Jesus and wisdom and those sorts of things. Things. And we can do, we can decide, we can act today in a way that we are called to. Though we learned a lot from Moses, our ultimate example is in Jesus. And we'll read Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, like Moses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance, endurance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God Yes, we, we looked at the life of Moses. We looked at what Moses, um, how the Lord worked through Moses and, and, and how the Lord was better than Moses' past, present, and future. But ultimately, we're, we're running to 
Jesus who did this, who lived perfectly. I pray that, that we, as we, as we go, I pray that we look for uh, life in him. I pray that, that we, we, we turn from what the world has to offer. We turn from the, the future, um, our future hopes on this earth, what they have to offer. I pray that we turn from whatever's keeping us from our past. And I pray that we pursue Jesus. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for your word. Um, and it being a light to our steps, Lord. Lord, I thank you for uh, the life of Moses, the example that he is to us. Not that our hope is in Moses, but I thank you uh, for that, that witness, that visual, um, the, the witness that Moses' life was, Lord. Lord, I pray that that as, as we learn from the life of Moses, and I pray that as we uh, looked at the life of Moses, Lord, I pray that that <clears throat> uh, that that examination, that 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 look into his life, pointed us to you, Jesus. I pray that as we as we go, Lord, it's loving and growing in you, and loving you, Lord, is is, is like a wave after wave after wave, Lord, and it will never it will never be complete. We thank you for that, Lord. It won't fleet. It won't, it won't leave. It's just constant. Lord, I pray that, that we just constantly pursue you through our days, Lord. Praise you in Christ's name. Amen.